Thank you, Andrew. Is this working? Yes. So, good morning. Um, many thanks to Stefan and the organizing committee for the invitation to come here today. It's a great honor, and I'm very excited to be here with so many folks who share the vision of open hardware innovation. So my name is Andrew Kong from UC San Diego, and I'm the principal investigator of Open Road since June of 2018. Here's the agenda, mostly at Stefan's request. Uh, what is Open Road? How did we get here, i.e. the journey? And where are we going, i.e. the roadmap? So to explain what is open road, you usually start with why there is an open road. And it's simple, the crisis of hardware design and the need to democratize access to silicon. So as we know today, taking ideas into silicon runs into barriers of cost, expertise, and risk. This is the famous Andreas Olofsson keynote slide from ISPD in 2018. The red curve is what says the cost of design is out of control. And therefore, innovators cannot tell how good their ideas are in terms of hardware metrics like size, weight, power, or PPAC, power performance area cost. It's too difficult to take ideas into silicon and iterate. So today, the transformation from Verilog or VHDL into manufacturable chip layouts is via tools that have really tens of thousands of command option combinations. Bleeding edge customers can squeeze you know, ultimate value out of foundry nodes, um, but very difficult to master. You need expert users, many manual steps. Run times are long, licenses are costly, industry is a duopoly which works against somehow openness and interoperability. Apologies to Anton, who's in the room, I know. Um, these factors compound and bring significant risk to chip designers. So Open Road was launched in June 2018 as part of the DARPA Electronics Resurgence Initiative. Road stands for Realization of Open Accessible Design. My school, UCSD, is the prime contractor. And the mission has always been to democratize IC design and to boost both hardware and EDA innovation at scale. So we have a contract with the US federal government. It's to deliver a tool that produces RTL to tape out clean GDS in foundry FinFET nodes with no human in the loop, in 24 hours, and in permissive open source. So we put together quite a nice team of universities, plus Qualcomm and ARM. And since 2020, a company called Precision Innovations Incorporated has driven R&D, and especially the support and outreach that the project also demands, because we want to establish an ecosystem. We've received major support from Google and from several commercial engagements, and um, the project ends in December, and there is a transition to sort of self-sustenance after that. So unlike commercial EDA, the focus of Open Road is on ease of use and runtime. It attacks those crises of design and innovation by attacking directly those barriers of schedule, expertise, and cost. And our vision is that this unblocks system ideation and design space exploration, very friction-free, no NDAs, no license managers to install, and there's almost zero overheads, you know, download and run. It's transparent, it's customizable, and uh, many folks have experience with this already. Important note is that um, Open Road is, an, is a tool that's built to last. It has the correct architecture and fundamental big bones. This is the incremental shared netlist architecture, which is the guts of every commercial place and route tool since the early 2000s. 
the shared netlist or abstract network adapter enables incremental netlist modification and communicates with synthesis, placement, CTS, optimization, routing, the timer. And this picture shows how if synthesis changes the netlist, then there's a callback that place and route is listening for. And then if place and route changes the location or the routing, this is updated via this shared physical or data model adapter, which handles physical information, such as location or routed shapes. And then the timer is listening for a netlist change. It updates delays and slews. The delay calculation uses updated location or routing information. And this is the architecture that enables up to thousands of sizing or incremental moves per second, which is at the heart of you know, the construct by correction mindset that underlies every physical implementation platform today. I always like to show these examples which are already a couple of years old. On the left is a reprogrammable AI platform in GF55 and a, right, a reprogrammable AI computing tile in GF12 nanometers from the Army Research Lab using Open Road. And on the right, the FASOC team at University of Michigan made a GF12 tape out that included this Open Titan SOC with integrated temperature sensors. And all the physical design and timing optimization, even back then, was done with Open, open Road. So, fast forwarding a bit to current times, um, we have a successful working partnership, I'll say a bit more about that in the middle part of the talk, of academic researchers, you know, PhD students who two years ago were physics majors in India, and EDA veterans who retired from cushy jobs so that they could advance the vision of open road. So there's been over 600 tape outs, I guess, in Foundry 180 to 12, most of which are the shuttles at 130 and 180. Um, but there's been 16 nanometer and 12 nanometer, 55, 40, many other nodes um, already. There's a growing community of contributors and supporters, over 18,500 commits, 84 contributors. Open Road supports education and outreach on many levels. So Carnegie Mellon just blogged about their classroom use of Open Road. IBM just ran a faculty development program uh, workshop in Calcutta or Calicut. And um, Open Road is also the basis for research in both EDA and hardware design. It helps small R&D teams, especially at hardware startups, who otherwise face a lot of barriers to exploring their system and architecture ideas. So this slide gives a few highlights. New York State high schools through universities, workshop number one at the VLSI Symposium this summer in Kyoto, and IEEE Solid State Circuit Society's PICO program also uses Open Lane, which uses Open Road. We're inside flow runners like Silicon Compiler and Open Lane, Semicon West in July. Amazon AWS's booth demo showed Open Road running in their commercial cloud. There was the Birds of a Feather meeting at DAC, which is kind of a, a marathon. It was the fourth in a series um, with over 90 attendees, also in July. And there's flexibility. For example, recent database and other extensions enable fine 3D heterogeneous integration layout generation. So these are two dies that are stacked on top of each other, and you can see tabbed views in the Open Road GUI showing multi-tier post-routed layout. And my point is that Open Road has kind of turned the corner. It's taken a while, but we're getting there. And just in case, the pointers to repos, the flow, the integrated app, documentation, Slack discussions, some videos, uh, courtesy of Matt Venn with, uh, I guess, uh, Tom Spiro and Matt Liberty, for example. Okay, so. That's kind of where we are. How did we get here? And for me personally, 
I would say this open road journey started actually more than a quarter century ago because I did something called the bookshelf in 1998, which also tried to deliver open source EDA with the goal of sharing knowledge and common infrastructure to remove barriers and accelerate progress of the field, especially among academic researchers. And in retrospect, the open road was informed by many, many lessons from the bookshelf experience and you know, the intervening quarter century or 20 years at least of my career. So we knew from the start that the biggest challenge would be critical mass and critical quality. So swing for the fences and seeding the Linux of EDA. Those were kind of the taglines of the project five years ago at the very first Electronics Resurgence Initiative Summit in 2018. And some of my talks have commented on related challenges. For example, openness with source code at the research leading edge is very much a matter of culture and personal choice. It kind of is a mirror of the person in a universe where academic EDA does not have a papers with code kind of culture or convention that you might see in computer vision or machine learning. And for whom are we building Open Road? If we build it, who will come? Who is we? What is it? Who will use it and contribute to it? And how will we continue beyond the project end date? So to build an ecosystem and a community, Open Road knew it must serve many stakeholders, government, semiconductor companies, strong supporters such as Google, the makers, IC startups, academic researchers and students, partners, and more, which is kind of tough. And by the way, this talk and all my talks are posted at my lab website, vlsicad.ucsd.edu, and now let me spend a few moments on lessons highlighted by this question in particular. If we build it, who will come? So, yeah, it's the question for open source EDA. If we, if we can build it, who will come? And in this VLSI SOC talk in 2020, I pointed out several ways in which open source EDA is truly a field of dreams, if you get the connection with the question. And some very early lessons for us were about the we in if we build it. So the first lesson was open source EDA goes far beyond academic researcher skill sets. In the case of Open Road, originally we proposed to DARPA that we would develop the whole thing with PhD students and postdocs at five universities. And separately, students and postdocs at a sixth university, University of Michigan, would serve in an internal design advisor's role. They would be the users, the product engineers, and AEs all rolled into one. And of course, we built in this separation to ensure that when commercial tools were used to report metrics to DARPA, the students who write the tools are not the ones evaluating with commercial tools because there's benchmarking and reverse engineering restrictions in the commercial EDA licenses, which all of us use in all of our universities. So this was the vision. What actually happened, uh, well, in Open Road, very soon we knew we needed a dedicated, experienced EDA architect and technical manager from outside the team. So we figure out how to make this happen. And Tom Spiru has been Open Road's chief architect and technical project manager since July 2019. And in industry, he previously led the teams that delivered Open Access, Primetime, Quartus, and other very successful products. So, um, that was great for Open Road. James Cherry was with us from the start, and he wrote the Parallax Timer. Matt Liberty has been full-time since January 2020. There's 200 years of EDA industry experience in this slide. To tool delivery, project management, infrastructure, key engines, and so on. And more important, these are industry veterans who share this vision of open source EDA as an enabler of research, and the mechanism by which we will train a next generation of EDA technologists. 
So I was in a workshop in Utah two days ago, and someone from a very large EDA company was com kind of commiserating that the average age of folks in the building in San Jose every year increases by about 0 0.8. <laughs> this is a big problem that's been going on for a long time. We need a next generation, and something like Open Road possibly can help. In any case, the, the lesson was that we must include professional EDA software developers and architects. And I'm actually very happy to say that Dr. Cho Moon joined Precision Innovations and Open Road just last month, coming from a 30-year-plus career in industry. You can find his name on LinkedIn. And food for thought here is, how big is the supply of Tom Spiro's and Cho Moon's, Matt Liberty's, relative to the demand or the need for open source EDA. We also learned a lot about skills and mindset. So the strongest contributors will have software skills and the right mindset. And some of Open Road's strongest developers have been undergraduate and graduate students from outside the US. They have interest in EDA, they're willing to be coached by industry veterans, and they've gotten thesis topics and publications along the way. So our observation is that physical design and EDA understanding is easier to grow than software development maturity. This is an ICAD 2020 paper, three years ago, where students from Brazil documented their experiences as developers on four separate tools <laughs> inside Open Road. They wrote global routing, clock tree synthesis, V1, IO placement, and tap cell insertion. Some of that code is still very much live. And it was three undergrads from Porto Alegre who brought up the very first version of our fast route global router. Two of them still work full time for precision innovations and the Open Road project. So the we who builds open source EDA must also include the right users who really are partners in this journey because ultimately open source EDA is still EDA. And um, that's my field. In the history of the industry, there has never been a tool that has succeeded without very intensive, what companies will call taxi cab mode, support that's delivered by the field AEs to the key beta customer power user. So a mainstream user files bugs and waits for fixes. A power user finds the fixes and the works around and brings these to R&D, basically becomes a problem solver rather than a problem reporter. In Open Road, we had to prove GF12 tape-out capability in our second year. So we hired a very experienced design services consultant to help make sure we hit this milestone on time. And he's still with the project. We need designers and you know, chip implementation experts to really drive the tool forward. Next, there's the question of who. Who will use open source EDA in the future? And here we started off with a totally wrong picture. Uh, it's kind of embarrassing almost. <laughs> Originally, we imagined that open source EDA would be a kind of utopia, where users would read the code, make enhancements and pull requests, so the availability of source code would fundamentally unleash a new form of user engagement with EDA tools. As you can imagine, such users are actually quite rare. Like, there's four of them on the planet today for Open Road. At first, many folks who contacted us were basically hoping for poor man's innovus. And they didn't understand the thousands of engineer years of professional R&D that's needed for that, and, and that it wasn't really a reasonable expectation of our project. On the other hand, the open hardware community has been very supportive, certainly from the technical standpoint, folks like Google or IBM Open Power or small chip companies, but more and more from a financial standpoint as well. 
And academic researchers also see the benefit of a robust backplane for research and tech transfer to industry. For example, over the past five years, Open Road has gradually become a very key part of the IEEE Council on EDA's um, activities to provide open research foundations via what's called the Design Automation Technical Committee. So calibrations, metrics for machine learning, the so-called robust design flow backplane for you know, place and route kind of research, and then the use of OpenDB as a Rosetta Stone for research and tech transfer. And our, our journey also taught us a lot about not research as usual. There's many challenges. If you, if you sit down and think about it for an hour, imagine that you're an academic project that by contract must deliver tape-out clean layout generation in a commercial FinFET node via permissive open source. There's so much cognitive dissonance there, it's, it's kind of stunning. And these are some of our early project announcements on our website. They hint at some of the issues that we had to navigate. For example, our tickle command names and timing reports needed to stay clear of industry copyrights because there's a history of folks getting sued for that sort of thing. And we preemptively addressed many issues as well. This and more slide is from the Open Road presentation at the very first ERI Summit, July 2018. When we submitted our proposal, we already had commitments from Parallax Software to open source its timer and donations of two commercial tools source code bases and permission to use an EDA company's established tickle naming conventions. Just to start, table stakes. So this is not research as usual. And our journey has had many other dimensions. Um, Open Road is in the conversation about workforce development and from the middle school pipeline to upskilling older workers. And it, it can open the STEM funnel without NDAs or licensed servers. It's a better on-ramp. You know, you start with training wheels and dirt bikes before you start riding MotoGP. I don't know if you like this metaphor. Um, these are pictures from UC Santa Cruz Extension, education and training programs in India, a Google site that was created by two high school teachers in California with open road support. I got to meet Matt Ben today for the first time. It's great. Um, so, you know, our community also tries to grow itself across a wide spectrum of users and application interests. And there's many channels, some of which are shown here, so please join in. Okay. So, next, the roadmap going forward. So this was the tough part of Stefan's request. I mean, I can sort of babble about uh, how we got here, and really, you could almost write a book. There's a lot that I left out, obviously. But where are we going? Um, Well, where is Open Road going? We, we work on pretty much the entirety of the set of green boxes you see here, which obviously stretches the team's resources. I want to mention two overarching directions that are absolutely inevitable. First, what is enabled by unlimited copies running at the same time? Because that's something you don't get with normal EDA. We've been working on cloud-optimized physical design, what we call Copilot, and this takes us into machine learning to predict doomed subtasks, you know, kind of distributed optimization, rewriting algorithms at a very fundamental level, and so on. There's obviously low-hanging fruit like black box hyperparameter optimization or auto-tuning and some sort of primitive reinforcement learning or learning from experience. Finding superior flow settings or best, you know, better initial guesses that internal design advisors would never even imagine. And this scales to thousands of cloud instances which we've done in recent projects with industry. 
When we talk about IC design or EDA tools, you know we're really talking about optimization. We're always optimizing power, performance, area, cost within the limits of licenses or people or servers or weeks of schedule. And these days we cannot talk about optimization without also talking about AI and machine learning. In fact, until last month I was leading uh, one of these National Science Foundation AI institutes called TELOS, um, which was about the nexus of AI optimization and, to a large extent, chip design. This is a cartoon of the hockey stick, Pareto frontier of clock period on the x-axis. So right is slow, left is fast. And then area or power on the y-axis, so up is larger uh, and bad. So what Open Road achieves today is shown in blue as a cartoon. And we have no clue where optimal is, which is black. What we do know is that Open Road has the ingredients that will get us ever closer to optimality via cloud, machine learning, open source, the freedom to benchmark and share data, which you cannot do with Cadence or Synopsys, so that together we can move faster along that green vector. The second overarching direction is to enable faster and more accurate exploration of architecture and floor plan options. So shortening the time to useful PPA feedback is incredibly valuable. If I had like $10 for every time someone from industry asked for, you know, physical synthesis in 10 minutes instead of 15 hours, I could, I could do something useful like go to Tahiti probably. So a new macro placer called hierarchical RTLMP, it's MPL2 in the source tree, understands RTL hierarchy and data flow, and it delivers quite human expert-like results. Uh, this is an AI accelerator in GF12 LP that has 760 macros. This is the RTLMP, uh, hierarchical RTLMP placement. Actually, for this test case, Hierarchical RTLMP dominates a commercial tools macro placer, and you can see the area, power, and timing results in bold in the table below when it's evaluated apples to apples by completing place and route with Innovus. So we think users could auto-tune this new macro placer. They can use it for early design space exploration or other possibilities. And early design exploration also depends on partitioning that understands timing and modern constraints. Triton part slash par is a very strong partitioner that also came out of my group and is new in Open Road. So check it out. If you've used HMetis in the past, this binary that you can't see inside for 25 years, this dominates HMetis. It's a total replacement. And just as with the journey today, there's many dimensions to how Open Road will go forward. So I hope we can talk about the technical roadmap and user needs during or after this conference. At least, you know, there's a few open road <laughs> stickers out there on the table, and I have some in my pocket, so let me give you one uh, while I'm here. But I want to touch on a few dimensions of the future, the first being tool development. And... Um, this is really hard to write, because with so few developers, you know, I talked with Tom and Matt Liberty, how do we create our roadmap and decide, you know, the plan for the next quarter or two quarters or year? And we have off-sites, and some of you may have even visited them or dialed into them. We have advanced user group meetings. We look for recurring issues or requests, and we try to make the biggest impacts for the most users. Sponsors do have priority, and now we have paying sponsors. Develop must, development must remain high quality, befitting the built-to-last kind of requirement. And our partners do drive development. For example, raising the priority of enabling multi-height, uh, cell support. They also directly support engineering efforts to make particular enhancements or dedicated, they pay for dedicated support bandwidth. 
And there's a huge backlog of R&D targets as well, and I just list a few samples here. CCS support, or DFT, or timing awareness in global route that correlates better with detailed route. To all the users here, synthesis is the agreed top priority. We agree that quality of results from our current use of Yosys plus ABC needs improvement, and feedback has been very clear on this. So we're looking for dedicated people or a mechanism to improve this part of the RTL to GDS flow. And we have this kind of guidance from users, you know, we're in the ASIC space, right, from users on where we should prioritize next steps. Other areas of R&D focus include CTS, UPF support, doing better with more of the PPA optimization levers, and this includes multi-bit flip-flop clustering for clock power reduction. Uh, we have a high school graduate who is working on that. Um, he's been working with me for four years, and he is trying out a full-time engagement with Open Road during this year. Timing and power recovery using operations such as gate cloning or VT swap. Another dimension of the future is governance, transition, sustainment. And here, all of your thoughts and suggestions would be very welcome on this topic. So our DARPA support ends in approximately 117 days, not that we're counting or anything. Um, how to sustain open road development and support has been a major focus for well over a year. Precision Innovations, PII, has received considerable support beyond DARPA funds for aspects of the open road project development. And hopefully, this will increase going forward. What we do know right now is that PII will continue to develop open road, and a new nonprofit foundation provides a path to continued inflows of philanthropic funding. We need at least these two elements to go forward. So PII was founded, for those of you who don't know, Tom Spiru, um, was founded in 2019 when Tom moved to San Diego to take on the chief architect position in the project. It was founded to bring EDA veteran talent into, the, into open road at kind of uh, an efficient costing or, or price model. The company is based in San Diego. It has three revenue streams. Open Road Development, it's a sub-awardee to UCSD on the DARPA contract. It takes on development outside of the DARPA award, and it has support contracts with Open Road users who need high bandwidth or some sort of agile in enhancement flow to the tool. So it has about 10 employees now and contractors. And because, as I said, a lot of support comes in from companies in the form of gifts, we want to make sure that this kind of funding stream can be applied as is best for the project. So a nonprofit foundation called the Open Road Initiative, uh, in, in the US we call it a 501c3, has been set up for this purpose. And the vision is to broadly foster open source chip design, EDA projects, and democratization of tool access and training to accelerate semiconductor-based innovation. So specific goals encompass open source EDA beyond open road. So think Sherlock, K-Layout, Yosis, and other tools, as well as proxy design enablements and education and training. They're all aligned with the vision, and everyone is welcome to contribute. And really, everyone can contribute. Um, documentation, a test, or some data, or code. I mentioned there is this 17-year-old who is now working on multi-bit flip-flop clustering. A visiting student from Korea has built a 3D version of our global placer, leveraging our latest partitioners that I mentioned, Triton Part. So here's an instance with 32 macros and 740 cells. Matt Liberty has supported this with DB extensions and new GUI views of the stacked tiers. So this can happen very quickly, in a matter of weeks. Another student is figuring out that proxy question. 
How can you, for example, in this case, scale the ASAP7 open source PDK to match PPA outcomes from Foundry 7 nanometer enablement? So the Foundry 7 nanometer PPA surface for this JPEG encoder is in green. And we can very easily box it in, even with auto-tuning of scale factors to match very closely. So our goal with this boxing in process with ASAP7 is to let designers understand very clearly what they're likely to see or even guaranteed to see in commercial 7 nanometer based on some number of trial runs with open source, open road on scaled ASAP7. So this notion of proxies is very important. And a third dimension, which I really should mention, is machine learning enablement. So if you think about it, Open Road here has this enormous advantage, because with commercial EDA, you can't share data or models. You can't op upload anything to chat GPT, and so on. You're stuck in a copyrighted, can't measure, can't model, can't benchmark silo. So these slides are from Professor Vidya Chabria at ASU, who has worked with Open Road from the very beginning. She's a close collaborator with NVIDIA on ML EDA. And she and her student are currently working on Pythonization and ML-directed APIs in Open Road. What everyone's familiar with today is Open Road's Tickle interface, but Open Road also has a Python interpreter. Um, the interpreter can run all the engines within Open Road except OpenSTA as of today. So it opens doors to users who aren't so familiar with Tickle, so basically the software community. And it also enables a playground for ML and chip design enthusiasts who want to explore the potential of ML algorithms in chip implementation. The vision is for Open Road to serve as a playground for EDA researchers and the chip design community, where ML and RL algorithms can integrate seamlessly and we can explore the potential of ML, both inside and around traditional EDA algorithms. Some of the Python APIs already exist, but a true ML for EDA playground will have to have three things. First, data representations and formats for left, dev, Verilog that integrate with ML libraries. Second, more Python APIs that return information from the database in formats that ML algorithms can interpret. And third, APIs that can have callbacks from the ML applications back to the database of the running tool. So for example, graph-based ML algorithms perform no node and edge transformations. These should map back to updates to the netlist and the database. And these data formats and APIs might look like, you know, for example, Open Road is currently trying to support what's called circuit ops format. This is recently proposed by NVIDIA. I think the archive paper came out last month. The research group led by Mark Wren proposed Circuit Ops, they'll publish a paper at ICCAD 23 in a special session. This is a graph-based representation of the netlist where every edge, pin, or cell is a node in the graph with edges that connect them. And every node has annotated tables with a variety of properties like transitions or slacks or logic functions. And having data in the form of graphs and tables allows more straightforward application of GNN or GCN-based algorithms, better querying of node features, batch parallel processing with Python or PyTorch. This slide shows some example ML-centric APIs that will make the ML for EDA playground easier to play in. So in the ML world right now, there's hundreds of papers at DAC and ICCAD and so on. But basically, there's three kinds of algorithms applied to EDA problems. Graph-based, image-based, and RL-based. So the APIs developed here will support these algorithms, and some examples are shown in the slide. Like returning congestion maps as NumPy arrays, or APIs that translate a transformation in the ML world back to OpenDB.
And I guess we can say that once this playground is built, I was trying to get a timeline last night and didn't succeed, but once it's built, ML-based optimization, or let's say RL-based placement and sizing, will allow RL agents to be trained within open road, and then traditional optimization with ML-based prediction can occur within open road. And with current tickle-based APIs to commercial EDA tools, you know this is pretty much impossible because you have to reinvent wheels. You have to implement underlying algorithms, which are black boxes in Python, for example. So this is a very unique opportunity that is in the future of open road as well. And I have a bonus. Um, this paper is from Professor Bei Yu at CUHK in Hong Kong. It was presented on Monday at the MLCAD workshop uh, in Utah. So this develops a conversational interface for human-to-tool flow interaction, and the paper presents five examples, example tests that were validated with production of working open road tickle scripts. Wow. So for example, first example, for the design named AES on the platform ASAP7, please perform synthesis with a clock period of five, blah, 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 blah. And it returns a working script. So this research involved ChatGPT4, and the paper itself is on archive, but this could not have been done with a Fusion compiler, right? It would be illegal. And there's another slide uh, with some details. So finally, I have a few background thoughts. I promised 40 minutes, and I'm at 41. I was targeting 41. So I, I actually wanted to intentionally skip the next three slides. These give what I call background thoughts to guide the conception of a roadmap for open road or any open source EDA effort. So I'm going to just leave the slides in the deck. But there's three messages. The first is, Understand the bar to success and impact. Second message, infrastructure at the end of the day is just a commodity. You just need one infrastructure, like an open source timer, that works. You don't need five that don't work. So more wood behind fewer arrows, please. <laughs> and third, because there's always, always data that cannot be shared, we need to work on proxies early and preemptively. So bars matter. Infrastructure is a commodity. Just pick one. Are the highway signs green or blue? <laughs> pick one. You know. And whatever blocks adoption, those PDKs, the tools, the IPs, you need a proxy. OK, so to summarize, Open Road has turned the corner on several dimensions. It's on its way to greater commercial use and in richer sets of foundry nodes. The project is ending this year for sure. And PII's commercial contracts, as well as the nonprofit foundation, are part of how Open Road will be hoping to sustain itself. On behalf of a really great team, I mean, I would like to offer you heartfelt thanks for support and feedback and trust in Open Road and its mission. And I hope we can continue this journey together. Thank you very much. Oh. Stefan, I... Two. Oh, yep, it's on. Okay. Amazing. Yep. Thank you, Andrew. That was uh, a very impressive talk. Sure. Um, I Open a, for questions. Yeah, questions. I have a couple. Uh -oh. um, we, yeah, I, I think there's probably several. I'll, I'll kick off. Um, compared to the original kind of goals for the project, you know, I think they were quite lofty and perhaps a little bit overly ambitious, you know, the government, whatever, strategically they wanted advanced nodes, 
24 hour turnaround for mm -hmm. designs, you know, I think that was extremely ambitious. How did you go over time sort of managing expectation and, uh, and a bit of a follow up to that? What do you think the killer app will ultimately be for these tools in the long run? whether it's developed by you guys or a continuation of the project somewhere down the line? Wow. Okay. I really should have expected these questions. But okay. Matching expectations. We had very, very kind and understanding program managers, uh, Andreas, uh, James Wilson, Serge Leaf, now Sung Kyu Lim. We, we're on our fourth program manager in five years. Um, but they've all been very understanding with um, sort of the lack of metrics and clear bars to clear in the original spec, the fact that we took on things that we were never expecting to take on. So for example, there was supposed to be a design advisors organization. There was supposed to be a, an idea program database. We had to like cobble that together ourselves by finding old friends who would sell us their source code. And it's kind of crazy how many things we, we took on. And we took on the entire... Um, implementation tool chain for um, probably too little money. And so um, they were all very understanding about um, changing expectations. So focus on automation, for example, not so much the PPA um, and the push button correct by construction or correct delivery of manufacturable GDS. That was a hard line for us, but you know, matching Innovus power performance area was not a hard line. Um, killer app, I think um, there's probably three vectors that we look at. One is sort of cloud native EDA and what it can be done with unlimited copies of open road in the cloud. Um, that leads to machine learning and sort of um, intelligent, um, let's say, early exploration of, of chips. Um, rapid prototyping is, is probably a killer app. We see a lot of people interested in sort of trustable estimates of what they will get in a commercial enablement. Once they do pony up $2 million for whatever EDA tools they choose to use with their favorite foundry. But how do they make sure that they're in a position to kind of write that check or, you know, sign that PO? Um, I think they need something like Open Road and there's a lot of interest in that. Um, let me think of it more, but, but I mean, the on-ramp to design, the early estimation seems to be where, we, be where we see a lot of traction right now. And then um, I should mention that the concept of hybrid flows seems to be of interest these days. Um, I showed, for example, two macro placements of, of this um, AI accelerator where the apples to apples evaluation was with Cadence Innovus. And um, so that kind of flow where the macro placement, the global placement, you know, top level clock tree locations might be performed by an open source tool, but then final implementation, maybe just detailed routing is done by a commercial tool at three nanometers, whatever. Um, that is certainly a viable path. And in fact, um, due to export control, my students cannot even touch three nanometers, for example. Although we work on you know, abstractions of problems, we absolutely cannot touch certain nodes just by law. So there will have to be certain hybridizations in the future for academic to commercial EDA if they're going to address advanced nodes. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and just one quick comment. I think it's fascinating to see all of the ancillary results, you know, you may not be taping out a seven nanometer chip that's doing, you know, like 400 square millimeters of ML IP, but there's a lot of um, ancillary, maybe like secondary effects of this, which is, yeah, opening the funnel to more people to get into the R&D and even just experimentation space with PNR tools because open source, right? Right. Yeah. We're very gratified to see, I mean, when Carnegie Mellon or UC Santa Cruz or the University of Puerto Rico. I mean, many people, University of Utah, when they show us that, oh, we're actually using your tool and students love that they don't, that they can put this onto their laptop or things like that. It's, it's very um, kind of uh, 
reinforcing, and um, it sort of keeps the team going to, to see these. It and like, there's a lot more these days. It only just occurred to me, you could put all of this on your laptop, and like, you would never even think of that with a commercial tool set, right? No, you, you can't. And, yeah. and um, you know, when you think about the vision of these CHIPS Acts worldwide, where high school students, community colleges, vocational schools, you know, training ed tech kind of entities are all going to be training VLSI designers to innovate. I mean, have you thought about the license servers <laughs> and the IT staffing requirements? And, and we do talk about the cloud, but it, it's, it's not easy to figure out exactly how that will work. Yeah. So I think um, open source is a path forward. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll open Sorry. question here. Hi, yeah, thanks for the great talk. Sorry I missed the start of it. Um, I was just wondering if you'd had any engagements with any commercial EDA vendors. So I, I'm basically just wondering what their thoughts are on, uh, on, on open source implementation. Maybe they have no thoughts about open source implementation and just kind of ignored it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just interested to see if you think they might embrace it, attack it, work with it. You know, where, where do you think that might go? It's a good question. Um, I think it's difficult for commercial EDA companies to embrace open source because maybe you know board members or Wall Street may not understand, so to speak. Um, I think at a technical level, um, all interactions are rather remarkably friendly. My former students who manage R&D teams in the big companies tell me that you know, when they hire an open road graduate, it saves them two years of bringing up in the, in the team. This junior engineer already knows all about software engineering and EDA and database architecture and regressions and so on. So um, I think at a technical level, we understand that it's not good when the building ages by 0 0.8 years every year. That's terrible. We need to fix it. We need to make our field less scary and repel repellent to new grad students so they don't have to re rewrite everything from scratch. And um, I don't know of a better path than something like Open Road. So. I if I may, I was going to ask a related question. What happens when you start stepping on their toes, though? And, like, it's not going to happen next year, but, I don't know, five, mm, ten years? Don't. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I think we were told, at, at, as we started, and we knew this, I mean, many of my friends said, what are you trying to do, Andrew? Come on. You know, you've been an advocate for the industry for your entire career, and this is true. And... Obviously, Tom and I think about this very often. Are we doing the right thing? And every time we come to the conclusion that, yes, we are doing the right thing. Um, so the catch cliche is that as soon as somebody loses a PO because of open road, then, you know, now you're an enemy. And I believe that moment has passed a long time ago. Um, I think open road appears in pricing conversations a lot with EDA companies and especially early stage hardware startups. But it's just um, the way things are right now. And I think um, EDA companies have amazing technology. They're um, the plan of record for everything. Um, we're not trying to compete with them. We're trying to serve unserved or underserved markets, applications, future applications, people who don't have budget, government labs, who can only afford a crippled single copy of the placer. It, it's, it's kind of sad how many people are underserved for various reasons, and they come to Open Road and find solutions, so we're happy about that. I reckon you are competing with them, but um, yeah, but, sorry. Uh, but <laughs> that's cool. I, like, you know. yeah. <laughs> um, this one's more of a technical question than a question about uh, you know, are you screwing over the business model of EDA companies? No, we're but, not. <laughs> we're, but, we're training up their next generation workforce, sure. is the way we, And, and this is, um, um, let me just say, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you know the synopsis invested in eFabless, for example, for precisely this reason, that eFabless, which has open lane, which runs open road, um, is a funnel 
of potential users. It opens up the mouth of that funnel in a very cost-effective way worldwide. And, and Synopsys saw a business reason to invest in eFabulous. So, and if you convince them that Python is a better interface language than Tickle, that would be fantastic. But um, in your initial block diagram where you had the different pieces of your solution and how they interacted with the database, I noticed the line to the synthesis tool was one way. And is that oh. what you intended? Because I noticed that what a lot of the EDA companies have done in the last few years is make the synthesis tool much more tightly embedded within the place and root tool and able to re-invoke the synthesis tool for physically aware re-optimization. And is that right. something on your roadmap? Um, well, we have things like a remapper module, which you know, is bringing more of something physical synthesis-esque into open road. Um, our synthesis capabilities are, are far from where we want them to be. Um, the architecture that you mentioned, that picture is actually from probably, I don't know, a 15-year-old slide that Tom had or that Verific or somebody had ages ago. So I'll talk with Tom about that bidirectionality of that arrow. Um, that's a great point, though. Um, we obviously don't have the resources to do everything that a modern physical synthesis tool would have under the hood. But Interestingly, it's not clear that these massive integrations have been leveraged you know, to the benefit of PPA, turnaround time, robustness, stability, that you'd, you'd hope for as a user. I think there's still a lot of work to do. There. There's a lot of work, yeah. I think the common reason I brought up is when you talk about sort of big bones and architecture for the future, that should definitely be a way out. Good. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah. So hi. Uh, uh, so yeah. Thank you for the wonderful presentation and all your work. And uh, just for the previous question, I do believe that Open Road has a different customer than these big EDA vendors. All this maker community and all would benefit from projects like this. Uh, my question would be more on how to um, get young people involved. So like, if I compare it to something like KiCad, right? This was also some years ago a very, um, uh, let's say, corporate-based uh, model that was there. And then KiCad came and it's helping so many people, right? And it has, uh, if you look at the sponsors that are there, there are big names out there that, that help it. Now, um, going ahead in the next year when, let's say, yeah, the DERPA funding and all, you know, ends and mm -hmm. things might, you know, get difficult for projects, open source projects like this. How do you, let's say, uh, how, how do somebody a, a kind of um, spread the word of open, yeah, of open road to young people and get them in involved, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Makers club and, you know, all these hobbyists and all. Mm -hmm. Do you have a plan? Do you have a, let's say, a very simple playground that they can test. Are you working on that? That would be my, my question. Right. Um, I think there's, way t there's a lot of fragmented disjoint efforts at the high school club level, high school teachers training up each other, um, offering curriculum modules that can be adopted. And you, even at universities or at high schools, you see all the roadblocks to having really high quality, shareable and scalable modular curriculum that can be you know, used in a sort of entry level VLSI course, digital design course. So I think um, this is a problem that's yet to be solved. Obviously, I, I think a lot of people via CHIPS Acts or other uh, frameworks are marveling at this problem as we speak. Um, I hope that Open Road or something better perhaps will serve you know, the goals of CHIPS Act and STEM education and in, in inspiring or exciting young people to, to look at computer engineering and hardware as a career. Uh, we'll see how that works, but if you have ideas, please write to me because um, like all faculty in the U.S., I'm dragged into many of these conversations pretty much constantly. 
And um, I don't think that I've seen a great solution yet. Yep, sorry. Uh, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's thank Andrew for his talk. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And now it's break time, I believe. Great. Yeah, have a quick, quick break. Back here, 20 minutes.